Okay, in that case, welcome everyone to a academic debate between the YouTube users Negation of uh, B and Jason Burns, uh, who I might have given an in introduction to had I not got such an awful call today. So uh, there is a, a title and a structure that I will uh, read out. The uh, title is Why Do You Behave As You Do When You Know God Is Watching? Uh, which I expect Negation of P will uh, expand on in the first 20 minutes because he's going to go first for up to 20 minutes and then Jason is going to respond for up to 20 minutes. We then have uh, two rounds of 10 minutes each where um, Negation of uh, P gets to ask uh, Jason uh, two questions and then uh, the reverse in the next 10 minutes. Then there is a back and forth for 10 minutes, and then there is a question and answer session. There's also a five minute break in there, but I can't remember where that fits in. Um, the question and answers, um, I'll give you more information on that during the course of the debate, but let's just crack on with it. Uh, over to you, Negation of B, your 20 minutes starts now. Thank you, DPR. Uh, just, I want to tell you thanks for doing this, and everybody out there in Blog TV, thanks for uh, taking time out of your Sundays, guys. I uh, really appreciate this, and a huge thanks to Jason. This is literally the second time you've shown up in the uh, Dragon's Den, so to speak, man, so thanks for what you're doing. That's great. Um, with all that out of the way, let's try to get through this as quick as possible, at least, you know, so we can, we can jump right into it. Um, my opening statement um, as DPR stated earlier, what we're here to discuss is the discontinuity between a person's actions and their self-proclaimed beliefs, namely God. Um, and I guess the best way to get started, um, I stated this in a video, and what I'd like to do is, is go ahead and just play the portion of my video that centers on this question. What I would ask of the audience, guys, especially if you hadn't seen the video before, please try to listen to all the instructions. Um, it, it's taken me a while to get the verbiage just right and really try to play along as much as you possibly can. Uh, after we get through that, then I'll just make a couple of clarifying statements and then I'll hand it over to Jason. So uh, if we've got that video, let's go ahead and queue it up and go. I thank you. Since you're still here, I assume you're willing to ask yourself some tough questions and are prepared to confront the answers, whatever they may be. I would like to thank you in advance for your time and honest participation. Keep in mind, the following questions are not rhetorical. You should answer every question, and if necessary, pause the video to give each issue as much attention as you feel is required. Also, please do your best to immerse yourself in the exercise. The more real world you make the thought experiment, the more reflective of your true beliefs the outcome will be. Okay, let's get started. I have found it best if you are the one to define your beliefs and your God. Remember, this is about you. The more honest you are, the better the results. Therefore, the terms should reflect your beliefs, not a set of values that are dictated by your church. Unless, of course, those descriptions are what you truly believe. Question 1. Do you believe, in most cases, a person's recurring actions reflect their beliefs? An example of this may include the fact that people are reluctant to touch a stovetop burner that appears red. This is because, over time, they have learned the color red, at least in this context, indicates the burner is hot and potentially harmful. Interestingly, most people will hesitate to touch a burner that is red even after they have been informed that the burner is not hot and the red coloration is due to it being painted or because of false lighting. This is because of the fact actions resulting from one's ingrained beliefs are difficult to overcome. Question 2. Is God omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, and or omnibenevolent? In layman's terms, what I'm asking is, is God all-knowing, all-seeing, all-loving, and all-powerful? Question 3. Do you believe God is the most significant, sentient being in your life? To clarify, would you agree that even though you may truly love other human beings, you should put God before all others? Question 4. Do you believe the most important relationship of your life is the one you cultivate with God? Again, 
Do you feel it's true that although you may want and even feel you need relationships while here on earth, your relationship with God is paramount to your overall well-being? Now that you have reacquainted and perhaps reestablished your foundation of basic beliefs and the characteristics of God, we can begin the thought experiment. Begin by envisioning a living person who you currently have a good relationship with. Most importantly, you wish to continue and or improve that bond by maintaining and developing their perception of you as both moral and ethical. Now this person need not be an authority figure. Examples might include a spouse, parents, friends, or even a child. The important aspect of this individual is they consider you to be a good person and you wish to maintain that status. Now I'd like you to picture yourself performing an act, better yet let's make that a sin, that you have done in the past and that if found out could jeopardize how this individual views you. Now the act does not have to be an evil act, just a sin that if discovered could negatively impact your image. Something like lying, stealing, or even something as benign as masturbating will do just fine. You got it? Okay, let's move on. Now I'm going to turn up the heat on you a little. Imagine that individual becomes aware of what you're doing. Would you stop what you're doing? Or would you continue the act? To be clear, you are aware that they're witnessing the sin. And they realize what you're doing. Would you stop? Now let's back up a step. Imagine that this person was aware of what you were planning to do before you actually did it. Now remember, you have not begun the act, but as before, they have full understanding of what you are about to do. Would or even could you begin to perform the act with them present and aware of what was about to happen? In other words, would slash could you start to masturbate, lie, or steal in front of that person that you love and desire the respect from. Okay, buckle up. This is where things get interesting. Given the attributes and the import you conferred to your God, I would like you to explain why you are willing and able to perform these sins with your God presence, while at the same time you're unwilling and even perhaps unable to commit the same sin in the presence of a human being. While that sinks in and you contemplate your answers, let me save us both some time by addressing the most frequent responses. The answer I get most often is that I can sin because God will forgive me. This response totally misses the point of the exercise. I'm quite sure the person you have in mind may forgive you as well. This does not change the fact that you will not commit that sin when they are aware of what you're doing. Again, the point of the exercise is to highlight the discontinuity between what you say you believe and how you act on a daily basis. The next most common assertion is that we're not perfect and we all commit sinful acts. I must disagree, at least in part. Now let me explain. I assume you have not continued and or started an act that was unethical or shameful in front of a loved one that was aware of what you were doing. Now to put it bluntly, have you masturbated in front of your parents and then went on to claim, well, no one's perfect, we all sin? Of course you haven't. In short, what this demonstrates, that you are perfect, at least regarding that act in front of human beings. You're just not perfect in front of God. In closing, I realize this argument takes time for most people to comprehend, and it can be difficult to admit that your own actions will not only lead others to conclude that you do not believe in God, but it may in fact force you to reassess your faith as well. I hope this was at least interesting and welcome your comments below. Please rate and favorite as you see fit. Also, I along with Live Life 8072 hold a weekly blog TV show called The Skeptic Fence. I would like to invite you to stop by and view what we do. 
We welcome people of all faiths and encourage everyone to call in during the question and answer portion of the show. Um, just in closing, uh, first, Jason, again, thanks for, thanks for doing this. And um, the main reason that I'm saying that is, is I don't know, you know that my video's been around for right at a month now, and I've got you know, a little over 1,000 views, 1,200, somewhere in that range. And even though I've had a lot of PMs and quite a few comments, Jason is the first person in either, in the comments or in um, a video response or any other way, has actually decide, or actually um, agreed to address the question. Um, everyone else is attacking the question itself as a group thought experiment and not applying it as it was intended. So I'm definitely looking forward to it. And again, thanks, Jason. I really appreciate you for kind of stepping out on a limb and being the first one to actually answer the question, which is, you know, why you behave the way you do when you know God's watching. Um, that's all I've got in my 20 minutes. So uh, I'll go ahead and concede the rest of it over to Jason. Jason, 20 minutes. Hello. Um, I just want to thank everybody uh, for having me here. And uh, I just want to thank um, Negation of P and uh, Mr. Jones and uh, Live Life and uh, just to offer a warm friendship to um, Mr. Jones and Live Life and just to say sorry if I've ever, ever said anything that's upset you please forgive me um, um, I want to say first thing um, the video when I first debated uh, Negation of P privately um, really shook me up in one way um, because it does expose any hypocrisy or anything that's not right in your life and uh, debating and discussing the video um, is a good thing from that perspective um, so that so that that's uh, you know and also um, it's been a really stimulating intellectual journey and for me in the last uh, week and a half thinking about the video uh, so those are the good things about the video um, I know that it's a case of pushing on to me why I act personally, uh, but I think um, some important things need to be talked about about objectivity. The title of the video does say uh, proof, um, and you know I think that title should be taken out because it's not it doesn't provide any objective evidence that a person doesn't believe. It might show that a person might not believe, but that's not necessarily objective scientific evidence. Uh, and I think the title uh, gives a, a misrepresentation there. Also about objectivity, um, and I say this with great respect, and I say this is critical to myself as well. Uh, but since 9-11, um, Sam Harris um, and Richard Dawkins and um, Christopher Hitchens and others have reacted re reacted quite strongly at, at that situation and wrote very strong polemical books and on the backlash of that uh, anger against religious extremism um, a whole tsunami of YouTubers, atheist YouTubers popped up and they became kind of missionary atheists and I think that that has not changed I think that backlash is still here and so therefore when people are making videos they think they're being objective but actually they're in the midst of that historical flow and I think Negation of P is in the historical flow and I'm in the historical flow and I think that he and me have prejudice that perhaps we're not aware of in that historical flow and you can see prejudice within this video um, for example um, Negation of P, and, I, and, and I, I say this as knowing that Negation of P is an honest, sincere man, and saying I'm just as bad as him, I have my own prejudice, so it's not like being critical of him personally, but you know, it does say in the video, sin and church, and then at the end it says all religions are welcome to come to, to the um, to skeptic fence, but within that video the you know, it's contextualized so that Christians can understand the video, sin and church. But yet, it's not, it's applied to Christians, but yet at the end, all religions are invited. So I think that the, it is specifically aimed at a certain group of people 
and and I think there's prejudice there and also in terms of using the words masturbation masturbation was used three times and it it does have uh, symbiotic uh, implications they have those words have con that word has connotations in a religious context and and so a religious a Christian person especially um, would would be powerfully affected by those words so I know negation is trying to be honest and sincere but I do think there's issues of, of that it's not really objective gauge to gauge whether someone believes or not um, uh, scientifically speaking for that person to think scientifically um, the other thing as well um, uh, peer review and things like that you know negation has, has submitted it to his friends atheist friends about five or six and one Christian uh, me from from the list under his video and you know I think if it's going to be seen as proof for even in, subjectively uh, to a person it has to be subjected to wider scrutiny uh, and of wider community uh, etc but this is a good start that negation of peace done um, second thing is uh, on the resurrection um, he talks about belief and then he says you make up your mind but then he says uh, but God's attributes and he mentions four attributes and I think he should uh, make up his mind whether to let people think completely their beliefs or whether uh, he should put, uh, leave that out and just put four comments of attributes of God but because he's put said four attributes of God he's kind of leading people to think in a specific way and that's not objective um, and I think um, you know I think it's important that you know we have to come back to this objectivity as well if we're talking about action and re re how, how people's beliefs work out in action and there's no room to talk uh, to, to discuss specific beliefs and I think we have to talk about objectivity in beliefs and if you're talking about Christianity, we've got to talk about the resurrection of Christ and objective for evidence for that. You know, the recent scholarship uh, with Dr. Balcom, uh, N.T. Wright, um, and people like that, uh, the source material, the Gospels, what are they? Um, Tatticus, Josephus, um, the lo lots of things like uh, the, the, uh, the Gnostic Gospels, uh, how do they relate to the Gospels? Um, Dr. Price, uh, Richard Carrier, uh, people like that who, who are coming against um, people like Dr. Balcom, N.T. Wright, and lots of critical issues that come down to about objectivity about history relates to Christianity. And I don't think this video even begins to tackle that issue. And that's important in relation to how we act. Is it based on objectivity? Because someone could actually say, I am actually perfect. I perfectly do everything. So what are we going to do then? The only way we're going to deal with them is that we pin them down on objectivity. Is it objective truth that they have? Um, I th I, what worries me with this video and a lot of atheist stuff and a lot about our Western culture is Jesus Christ had the most powerful influence in history. He influenced the East, uh, even Gandhi said he was the most perfect person he'd ever read about, thought about. H.G. Wells in the West said G Jesus had influenced history like nobody else. Um, it, it, Jesus has uh, influenced the Galilean Jew, has influenced science, has influenced uh, politics, has influenced literature in every department throughout history. Um, uh, socially, um, you know thousands of hospitals tens of thousands of hospitals we I mean, start in his, in his name and we and we don't discuss about Christ in our Western culture enough and I think as atheists that you need to address that um, and uh, the next thing as well is recent research in neuroscience uh, recent research in neuroscience has shown why people act the way they do um, and you have got to understand the way the brain works the brain processes information at the front uh, logically and in the middle of the brain it processes uh, emotionally now when a person uh, learns habits of uh, practical habits in their life um, if the, the, in, in the middle of the brain um, it, it's the pain and pleasure together working together now if a person's in pain it triggers pleasure okay so a person could say for example 
um, not masturbate in front of their family, okay? But when they are alone, um, if they're in pain in some way, and pain could be stress, stress affects pleasure, um, um, depression affects pleasure, um, a whole variety of uh, emotional, is difficult issues that people can go through triggers off pleasure. Uh, so what that means is if someone won't masturbate in front of their family, if they are alone, they, it will trigger off their past behavior habits of masturbation. The pleasure process will come up. So they will, and they've got five seconds to choose whether they react to that. And so it, it has a powerful impact on how they will act uh, on, uh, alone. Um, and, you know, uh, so that, that's a, that new, the recent research in neuroscience is extremely important in talking about this issue. Um, and also, you know, I listened to some real, um, you know, some real deep philosophers. I think there's a guy called John McDowell. Um, there's another guy, um, uh, Bernard Williams. Massive deep philosophers. But, you know, the, the very sort of, a theory, uh, the very airy fairy technical stuff. But when you get into the practical daily life, you know, then things are more complex. And I think this 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 video is it's very logical, it's very precise, it's all very neat. But when you hit real life, if you're hit by a number of stimuli, difficult problems, I don't think you can narrow it down um, perfectly, as as good as we think we can. Um, having said that, the Bible actually agrees to some extent with what negation of peace trying to achieve. It's trying to show connection between action and beliefs. And the Bible talk, talks a lot about, you know, your beliefs should match, uh, your actions should match your beliefs. It talks a lot about, um, you know, walking the light, etc. So that's, that's all I can remember from my notes so far. So thank you very much and thanks to everybody. Okay, thank you. And my understanding is now that <coughs> uh, Jason has five minutes in, in which to formulate two questions, which uh, Negation of B has five minutes to answer. Back to you, Jason. Um, the only thing I can think of Negation of P um, is two things. I think one is um, the Apostle Paul talks all fall short of the glory of God, and Seneca says his lecture hall was a hospital. Does that have any bearing? Does, does those two thoughts, it's just one question really, do those two thoughts have any bearing on this video to your mind? The short answer is no, Jason. And the, the main reason is, is because I look at the Bible, and again, I'm not trying to be confrontational or being belittling in any way, but I see the Bible the same way as I see any other book. Um, like, let's say, oh, I don't know, the Odyssey, the uh, Iliad, Homer, you know, across the board. There are truths that are in each book. But, but the problem is, is we don't take the Iliad and worship it and think that everything that you know, um, any of the characters there did um, mandates that, that we follow something else. So even though Paul states we're all going to fall short, okay, um, I'll grant you, in fact, Jason, and kind of backing up a little bit into your 20-minute deal, you know, you're, you were talking about we need to look at the validity of God and the historical, you know, all, all that as far as not only Jesus but the Bible and all that. Jason, for this... Um, this debate, yeah. um, I will absolutely grant you that all of that is real and that you, 100%, what you believe is actuality. Um, now, when I come back to my, my question, I'll kind of go into that, but, but what I'm saying is, is that, no, this, this um, question derived from a private conversation between me and Live Life of an, in a real-world action that... It, it just was a, um, a light bulb moment. It came on, and we discussed it, and from that point, we started to develop this. Um, now, that the, uh, the thing about Paul and that statement is, is it's very, very all-encompassing. 
um, it's basically like saying that I will fall down before I die. I'm pretty sure that if I don't die within the next five minutes, there's a good chance that I'm going to trip and fall down. So an all-encompassing statement like that is, uh, let's say, I don't want to say meaningless, but it definitely is not something that would um, have a predictive quality or be impressive in any way. So just because you know, Paul states that, it, it doesn't mean a whole lot to me. Um, I hope that helped and I hope that answered it. DPR? Uh, Jason, um, you, the, this section allowed you two questions. You only had one and um, we have time remaining. I don't want to take that opportunity of asking a supplementary or second question. Thanks, Mr. Jones. Um, what about the Seneca quote? Um, my my lecture hall is my hospital. Does that have any resonance with you for your video? Uh, really not again, Jason. Um, I think the problem that um, theists and atheists run into is that we're, and again, I'm not trying to be, you know, label all Christians or you in general or anybody else, but what I see is, is that it, it seems to me that most theists and most atheists, um, their main difference in coming to an argument or a belief is that the theist will base things on, at least in part, an argument from authority. Therefore, if someone that has a, oh, a big name, um, a recognized figure, says something, it holds more weight than someone who doesn't. Um, whereas an atheist, it doesn't matter what the person's title is. Um, Richard Feynman was, had a great quote on this. I can't remember off the top of my head, but basically he said, he didn't, it didn't matter who you were, who you were with, what letters were behind your name. If you're wrong, you're wrong. And I think that that is what um, atheists feel in general. At least that's, I know that's how I think, is that I am going to run reality through the filter of what my logic, my reasoning, and my understanding of the facts are, regardless who says it. So it's, to me, it's almost uh, irrelevant who says it. It's either true or it's not. And if it's not, great. If it is, great. If my, if my seven-year-old comes home tomorrow and tells me something that I didn't know before that's true, I'm going to take it just as much as if I heard it from Stephen Hawking. So I hope that helped. Okay, shall we move on to the next section, which is negation of B, uh, asking uh, two questions to Jason. And again, the same 10-minute time limit applies. Or do you want to do that, Jason, or... I didn't know when the five-minute break was going to be. I don't care. I'm good to go whenever you are. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, did you want the break, or did you want me to go ahead and ask my questions? Um, no, go on. Yeah, ask your questions, bro. Okay. If that's okay. Uh, all right. Um, this has to do with objectivity, and it seems that you don't feel that um, my questions are objective. And... Okay. I guess the problem I have with that is that beliefs, and I, what I'm, the question I'm asking is, do you, do you agree with this? Even though a belief may be, by definition, a subjective term, we can test for those beliefs. Um, the example I will give is, I believe in a mysterious force. We do not understand this force in any way. My job is contingent on this force. Um, and because of my belief that this force is real and exists, there are certain limitations that I impose on myself. Now, the force that I'm speaking with is gravity. When I'm in my aircraft, I do not step out of the door when it's off the ground. Now, there is no one who can tell you definitively what gravity is. What it, we can see the um, reaction to it. But again, I don't know if those reactions are real. In fact, I don't even know if what we're doing now is real. We could all be a brain in a jar for what, for what, you know, for argument's sake. And gravity is just part of the construct of the matrix, for, for, for lack of a better term. But I believe that. Therefore, I don't do as Neo did and walk off the side of a building. Now, again, I was a little disappointed because the 20 minutes that you had, you didn't address personally anything on the, um, on the argument. 
you talked about everything except how it pertains to you. Now, just as I can look at how gravity affects my decisions, I'm trying to apply the same methodology to how your belief in God affects your actions. And I'm seeing a disconnect there. So could you explain that for us? That's all I had. Go ahead. Go ahead on that one. Okay, bro. Uh, first of all, um, you talk about objectivity and, and as if Christians aren't interested in objectivity and names. Um, you know, I, I talked about I told you I talked about the resurrection of Christ and you know Tatticus and Josephus and and you know there's information there about uh, who Christ is historically and the Christian faith is based on um, a plausibility of structure of basic facts. Okay, um, so I think you're being a bit prejudiced there. Um, the second thing is. Um, uh, I also, you talk about um, the Apostle Paul and things like that before as well. You know, I gave you recent research. It's recent research I'm talking about um, by uh, Dr. Robbie on neuroscience. Uh, so I gave you neuroscience uh, and about how uh, actions work. Um, and if you thought about what I said, you know, it answers some of your questions about masturbation, why people masturbate. Um, and, um, you, you know, I think that the issue of why I quoted Seneca and why I quoted, um, why I quoted the Apostle Paul is I gave you two sources of a basic reality, a basic experience is that, you know, we, you, you won't like this, but we, we fail. We are, we are not perfect. And your logical construct is it, it it's a it, it's in it's in a make but we it's in a make believe world when we hit reality in real life you will find holes in your logical construct okay when you listen to bernard williams he's an ethicist and he talks about we've got to look at real life and um, and you know even he who's a perfect logician like left his wife and messed up you know, and he lived by logic and reason and wanted all things logical and reasonable, reasonable and he made a mess of his marriage. <laughs> but it's not, that doesn't mean to say he doesn't believe in logic and reason, it just makes, means he made a wrong turn in his life. So we've got to get back to being practical in everyday life. And that's the beauty of Jesus' teaching. It's about being a farmer, he talks about farming, he talks about, it's all, it's all in everyday life experience. Whereas the academy is in the university and it's all um, away from real life. Um, you know, we've got to get into real life and how it works in real life. So when I quoted Seneca and the Apostle Paul, they're realists. They're working in the real life. They, they know what it's like when someone comes home uh, drunk or when the wife's not happy or whatever. That's what we've got to get to, as well as the logical uh, pincer movement of analysis, which, which you like and which is very good. But let's get into practical everyday life. I'll give you a little story. Um, a person came to Charles Spurgeon, this guy here. Uh, he was running a theological seminary, and a guy came to him and said, uh, can, will, you let me into the, will you let me into your theological seminary? And he said, why should I let you in? He says, because I'm perfect. So Spurgeon got a glass of water and threw it onto the, onto the guy. And it went over to the guy, and the guy got really angry and said, How dare you? And Spurgeon turned around and said, I thought you said you were perfect. You're not so perfect now, are you? And that's the problem with your video. Your video is like, sounds like negation. You're a logical Pharisee that, that you're hunting people around um, as if you can pin them down with your pincer moved logic and expose their beliefs and hypocrisy. At the end of the day, not everybody is perfect. Like I said, the Bible agrees with you to a part. Actions do tell us about what people are like. But your video is not realistic. It's not rooted in real life. We are not perfect. Even the most logical, reasonable person will make mistakes, will fail, even if they live to their own perfect standards. If you're making love to your wife, you do not take a book of logic with you. Okay, 
Um, you you will go, you will make love, and while you're making love, you might have a wrong thought of another woman or whatever. You know, it doesn't mean to say you don't love your wife. Logic and reason is great, but it it doesn't deal with real life as well. And you need the two in balance. You're on this side, logic and reason. Let's get it all sorted. I'm saying, yeah, logic and reason, but let's 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 just be practical. And you've been reminded underneath your video uh, about it, you know, a, a challenged about that, and and you, you don't seem to realise that we've got to get into practicalities as well. How does it work in real life? Thank you. Okay, um, I've taken up most of the ten minutes, but seeing as we've cut a lot of the previous section short, um, and negation has a second question. Um, I'm, I'm going to allow it to overrun a little bit if needs be. Um, do you want to have a second question, negation of P? Uh, yeah, I could. I mean, first, is Jason, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. I, I want to just address the objectivity and the, and the what, because what this speaks to is it goes into what you were saying as far as this is not a real world experiment. I definitely have to disagree on that. I mean, Look at the definition of, of objective. It's not influenced by a person's feelings or opinions in considering and, in, and it represents the facts. I can't talk. Um, now, here's the thing. I don't believe you're sinning. You state that you're sinning. And you know you're sinning. That's objective. It is a fact that people sin. Objective statement. You state you believe in God. Objective statement. You have made a truth claim as far as you're going, as far as I know, all I can go off of is what you say. You say you believe, I'm going to take that statement as existing. You said it. You claim that um, everything runs cr contrary to basically what I'm saying in, um, in this video. But the problem is, is that I can show line for line that there is objectivity to everything. People sin. They believe in God. The, the entire makeup of this is based in reality because it's a day-to-day -day experience that every person has. And again, Jason, I have to point out that it was never meant to, to validate or invalidate any religion, you know, Christianity or not. It was meant as a personal question to the theist as why do you act the way you do when you know God is watching? And we've been on blog TV now for, you know, 30, 35 minutes, and we still have not heard one word on you explaining the discontinuity between what you say you believe and what you believe. And I, I'm not trying to get mad here, but I am getting a little frustrated because we, we've talked about this many times before, and, you know, I've I've tried to make it clear. Um, even with the preface of my um, my um, my video, I I say it over and over and over again. This is a personal experience, and don't apply it to a group. And answer the questions, not just tell me how Plinicus works into this. How you know? I get, I grant you, God is real, Jason. The problem is, is that it digs your hole deeper. It doesn't make it easier, and I'll explain that later because I know I'm running out of time. Again, okay, well, let's, let's allow right. Jason to uh, address that point. It's being suggested, Jason, that you are not answering the question. Well, you see, the problem with negation, and it goes back to, um, you know, if I write a play, um, and then I take it to somebody, and they criticize it, it's my baby. And because it's my baby, it's hard for me to look at it objectively. He's done this video, and it's his baby, and it's hard for him to look at it objectively. He's making a big assumption. He's making a big assumption that people will be perfect every time, that they will not sin before their loved one every time. And that's where he's made his big mistake. The fact is that people will not be perfect every time before their loved one. That's the point. If someone comes into the room and they're looking for, uh, and, and you're about to masturbate, or you're about to take drugs, you might, or you might be an alcoholic, and you don't drink because you love your loved one, and you won't drink in front of them, um, yeah, you might do it that time, but like I said, I told you about the neuroscience, it's related, a person's bad belief, uh, negative beliefs beforehand, for example, 
a person's negative beliefs beforehand, say they might be a al an alcoholic, they might have been an alcoholic once before, okay, and the family comes in, and so they're not going to drink. They were about to drink, but they don't drink, right? So they were, they were okay that time. But then another time, they might have gone through stress, or they might have gone through difficult time. Now, like I said, the, the neurosciences, the brain works on two aspects. Frontal lobe, it analyzes logic. The middle part of the brain, it, it deals with pain and pleasure. Now, research was done in 1950 that with rats, that if the, pe the, the rats... Um, if, if rats um, um, are stimulated painfully, they think they're experiencing pleasure because they're connected to, together. So the scientists were shocked when they provided a lever for the rats to receive pain. They actually went to it because they were receiving pleasure and then they all died. So what that means is an alcoholic might not react to someone perfectly for a few weeks before their loved one, uh, but... If they go through stress or if they go through anxiety, the pain reacts and affects the pleasure. And therefore, they're reminded of the old behavior and then they end up uh, turning back to the alcoholism. So what I'm saying is he's assuming that everybody's going to be perfect every time before their loved one. And that's his big mistake. Again, it's not rooted in practical everyday life. This is okay for someone who likes to read logic at home. But what, is this okay if you're a nice middle class person and you've got lots of time to read logic? And it's very good and it's helpful to get us to think about it. And it has thought. But it's not okay when it hits real life. And he doesn't realize that. Okay, you, you, ever, you ever ran a little bit there, Jason. But I, as I say, I didn't want to interrupt you. I think what we'll do is... Um, allow negation of B to come back briefly on that point, then we'll take our five minute break. And what I was also going to suggest is the next section that you have down is a back and forth for 10 minutes. Seeing as that we've, we've uh, run short on previous sections, do you want to extend that maybe to 20 minutes? Because that might be um, more interesting. And then, uh, whilst you're thinking about that, can I just uh, remind people that the last 30 minutes is going to be a question and answers from the audience. If you would like to ask either of the uh, two speakers a question uh, either uh, live you can send a contact request to um, Magic Sandwich Show um, or alternatively you, if you don't want to appear you can put a send a question to me on Blog TV um, please pose it as a question not a statement uh, and then I will use my discretion um, so delegation did you want to come back very briefly and then we'll we'll take the uh, five minute break I, uh, uh, I'd love to, but I don't know. It. I mean, Jason, is that fair? Did I get an extra kind of bite at the apple, so to well, speak? Well, Jason never ran a little bit, so I, I'm, I'm trying oh. to be as diplomatic as I can be. <laughs> oh, I, I see what the what the deal is. Um, the only thing I'd say is is that was all great information, but again, it didn't speak to the question at hand at all, as far as I could tell. So okay, well, let's leave it that. For, we'll take the yeah. five minute break, and then we'll come back and say, do you want to do twenty minutes to and fro? Uh, it. Uh, Dr. Jones, okay, we do 10, please. Yep, no please. problem, we'll do 10. That's okay. what was originally agreed. Okay, we'll be back in five minutes. Okay, sounds good. Okay. All right, going live. Okay, welcome back everyone, or if you're here for the first time, you're joining a live academic debate between the YouTube users Negation of B and Jason Burns. Uh, the topic is, why do you behave as you do when you know God is uh, watching? Um, we're now having what is um, referred to as a 10 minute back and forth, and then we'll be taking um, questions from the audience. I say, if you would like to ask us a question, either send a contact request through Skype to Magic Sandwich Show, or um, post me, DPR Jones, a uh, PM on uh, the blog TV and I will read the question out for you. Okay, so 10 minutes uh, back and forth. Um, I don't know whether we need to toss a coin to see who goes first or whether you'd like to decide between you. Uh, it's fine with me. Okay, uh, I'll just decide for you. Jason, uh, you can start. 
Okay. Um, thanks, you might want to unmute your microphone. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Jones. Um, <coughs> I just, uh, I'm just going to read the psalm and then just ask a question about it, if that's okay. It says, Psalm 51. It says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire the truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts you will make me to know wisdom. Purge with me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blood out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors the ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. That, the context of that psalm is King David was a king, he loved God, but then he was having a relaxing time at home. He saw Bathsheba, he fancied her, he thought, I like this, I want a bit of, I want a bit of crumpet. And he sent uh, Uriah, uh, Bathsheba's husband, off to war, purposely made sure that he got killed. Then he had his way with Bathsheba. Then the prophet Nathan cornered him and pointed his finger at him and said, you're the man, you sinned. And in his brokenness, David repents, and this is the psalm. Now, the question I asked to negation of P, did David believe in God because he, he'd done that sin? Okay, we've got that. Negation. I actually love Psalm 51. That's that speaks absolutely perfect to this uh, this uh, thought experiment. Um, would I say that David believed in God if, number one, again, we're talking out of a book that, let's say, I don't quite believe is real, but, again, I'm going to give you that it is real for this argument. I would say no. In the same way that I will not step out of the airplane at 30,000 feet because I believe gravity exists, he would not sin in front of Uriah, but he still sinned in front of God. So I love your analogy, Jason, because it talks exactly to what I'm talking about. As a human, David knew that if Uriah was present, he would have hell to pay. Potentially, Uriah would kill him or there would be other things to do. Not to mention just how bad he would feel, because if you remember what the, um, what the relationship between... Um, David and Uriah were, they were friends. And if he had to have done that in front of him, it would have cost him pain to the point where I don't know if he was, would have been capable of doing it. Now again, I know this is subjective because I don't know what he could have done in front of that person. But what I'm saying is, is this speaks exactly to the argument. You have demonstrated that David does not have the capacity to commit that sin, at least in front of Uriah, but will do it without question in front of God. So we are perfect, Jason. We're perfect when there's another person present. That's the perfection argument. You cannot, at least I don't know of people, that if they believe something is wrong, will do that. In a moment. Yeah, go ahead. In a moment. Yeah, it's back and forth. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Mr. Let him finish. No, no, I, I, was, I was done. That, that's fine. Go ahead, Jason. Okay, Jason. Okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones. Sorry, uh, negation. You no. said, I quote, you said, you were perfect before you, you, Uriah. What about if he has Bathsheba in his brain? What implications does that have? If, he's having, if, he's, if, if Uriah's there, but David's having his wicked way with Bathsheba in his head. Okay, what, negation. Uh, you know? He's still before. Okay, wait, wait, wait he's still. He's still. No, the next I, I, thing. The next thing is. Jason, wait, no, no, no. We're not going to do the. No, we're not going to do the Ganesh stop, stop, stop. We're going to on both of you, please. Jason, oh. you made a point. Let let negation deal with that point, one at a time. Okay. Uh, all right. So the point is, is now we're talking about thought crimes. Again, if Uriah knew 
what J what um David was thinking, and David was aware of that. Let's say that instead of thinking, because the thought crime aspect is a little, well, let's say out there. What I'm saying is, is that let's say that he's talking about doing it with his friend or even just talking to himself. Uriah walks in and he figures out that Uriah can hear what he's talking, what he's thinking, whatever. I guarantee you he stops just as if anybody else would because it's his friend. He doesn't want to harm that individual. He doesn't want to, he can't bring himself to do it in the face of another person. And the only place that we have to worry about thought crimes, Jason, is in the book that you're talking about. So unless we can get past this and you can show me why you will not commit the act physically, because that's what the argument speaks to. We're not going to go into thought crimes. Okay, well, you seem to have tickled Jason, so let's uh, see what he has to say. It's just, it's just, I just love it. I just absolutely love it. Uh, negation, you're just like... I mean, I mean, it's just not, I mean, come back to this reality thing. I mean, he's not, I mean, you, you, it, first of all, David would sit in front of Bash. He, he, he would manipulate Uriah and get him dead, and then he'd have his wicked way with Bathsheba. And the problem is there, he knows, David knows God is watching. He knows God's watching, but... He, he, he can't help himself. He, he, he wants a bit of crumpet, you know, because that's his weakness. Hey, Jason. All right, he, I no, no, wait, wait, can wait, wait, I, no, wait, I haven't finished. Wait, Please, can wait. I just finish? He, he okay. wants a bit of crumpet. And the second thing is this bringing in Uriah all the time or, uh, and, and getting someone, you know, I don't know where you live, uh, Negation of P, but I don't... Well, rather I don't, get personal, let, let him perhaps address okay. the point. Um, he wanted a bit of crumpet. What's wrong with that? <laughs> negation. Okay, uh, well, the problem is is that it injures. Okay, I want to change the topic. I want to kind of change this around a little bit because maybe it'll help. Okay, um, number one, why, is, why would that infidelity be wrong? Well, there's a, there's a thousand different ex explanations we can go into and get into objective versus subjective morality and all of that crap. I don't care. Let's say that I give you every point that yes, it was wrong, you're still not able to explain to me, Jason, why he, or more importantly, what the entire premise of the argument was, why you will be perfect in front of other people. You say that I'm not dealing with reality. Jason, you're the one who has, I mean, maybe I'm wrong on this. When you're in another room with somebody and there's something that you feel is unethical, you will do that act in front of them, yes or no? Jason. Could, could you say that again? Could you ask that question again, I guess, please? Sorry. What, what it boils down to, Jason, is, is that with Uriah and David, it's the same thing as you and potentially your mother or somebody else. David couldn't do it. You're telling me that I'm not dealing with reality when the reality is every person on the planet acts just like David did, including you. So again... Why don't you commit unethical acts in front of people when they're aware of it? You say that I'm not dealing with the reality. That is the reality, Jason. It's not, it's not reality negation. People do, you know. I don't know. Take anger negation. Take exactly. anger, right? You, someone comes into a room, you want, you want them to really feel good about you, okay? And, but, and you're about to get angry, and you see them, and you stop. Okay, and you do that perfectly all the time, and you love that person. But you come home from work, you're having a stressful day, you're going to blow your top. It's just human, <laughs> you know. It, it, you're not going to. This is the point. You, you're just not. Think, you're not in reality. This is this is a logical construct that you've done, you know. And it, it only works if you can try and pin down a special sin like masturbation. No normal person in their right mind is going to masturbate before their parents. And you've put that three times in your video, okay? No one in the right mind's going to do that. So, so if can you I just clarify something? Um, it might be helpful. Um, I don't want to get bogged down in masturbation, but I think you just said masturbation was a sin. Is that right? Um, I just, I, sorry, I just said it was a sin. Yeah. 
I, 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 I just wanted to clarify whether you meant that or whether um, it was a slip of the tongue. It, well, it, it's irrelevant, Mr. Jones. The, the point is, he, he used it three times, okay? And I'm just also, using it. Oh, I'm Jason, just, I'm clear, wait a second. Wait a second, to be clear. I also used stealing and lying three times. And what yes. I said, yeah, so, no, 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 no. You're not getting away with that, Negation. You're not getting away with that. You're not getting away with that. Come on. Three times you used it, bro. Well, pause there, gentlemen, please. Pause there. Um, it's no good if you're speaking over each other. And also, um, that is the ten minutes of the session. Now, I'm quite happy if you two are to allow it to run um, on for a few I'd love moments. To. No, I, I'm, I'm happy to continue to the next bit, Mr. Jones, if that's okay. Okay, well, the next bit, uh, if I just remind everyone, is a question and answers from the audience. Uh, see, I've got one contact request. If you would like to ask a question to either Negation of B or uh, Jason, send a contact request to Magic Sandwich Show, or one word, on Skype. Alternatively, in Blog TV, send a uh, PM to me, and I will read your question out. And the first question I'm going to read out... Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones. Yeah. Um, I thought we agreed to just a last five minutes round off. I thought we agreed to negation has five minutes to finish I'm and I have five minutes. Jason, you are absolutely right. I do apologise. Um, okay. So it'll be five minutes each and then we'll take the questions. So um, again, if you want to, um, if you have a question, um, please send me a PM or a contact request. But you're quite right. Um, I missed that bit out, Jason. Thank you for reminding me. Um, I can't remember who was supposed to go first. I'll let negation go first, if that's okay. Five minutes closing negation. Okay, uh, this will be fairly quick. Um, Jason, I'm not being this personal, man. I really think that you're trying, but I have to, um, I have to state this, that I, I do feel very disappointed. Um, I came into this thinking that you were going to address the question. Um, thus far, we haven't, you haven't said one word about what the real question is. Um, so now I have an additional question. Is not only the first question, but also why it seems there is not a theist yet that will even touch the question, let alone, you know, whatever. Um, I think that if we were in a formal debate, one that was scored, which I have been a part of before at, at the college level, Jason, and again, I'm not trying to be negative. But if you go back over the tapes, the question was very straightforward. And by avoiding the question, you would have absolutely lost hands down. Now, I'm not trying to win this. I don't care. All I'm trying to do is, is ferret out truth. But we will never find truth if we don't ask the questions. That's where my disappointment comes in. Oh. I'm done. Uh, first Jason, of all, you have five minutes. Okay, first of all, Francis Schaeffer uh, knew Switzerland out very well. He took some students, he got lost, and, and while he was stood waiting uh, with his students lost, um, he said to them, make sure that you really ask questions and think. And, you know, I, from Francis Schaeffer's influence, we're taught as Christians to think, think about, and I want to think, and this video has stretched me, it's been fantastic, I've loved every minute of it, I've loved the research and the thinking, I've got stacks of notes here, I've read on neuroscience, I've read on philosophy, I've read everything and thought everything, and the whole pro problem with negation is because he's too, too busy thinking about logic and he's in his own little world, he needs to hit reality and think about this issue. We don't react perfectly all the time. That's the problem with his, the, the video. Um, not saying there's no value in it. There's great value in the video. Um, I, I, I want to thank Mr. Jones, Live Life, Negation, everybody come in. And I just thank you so much. And thank you for a wonderful opportunity. And uh, thank you for all the effort that everybody's put in. And I've just had a fantastic time. And I wish Negation the best. He, he's he's uh, a sincere thinker, he tries his best and I appreciate what he's trying to do. So thank you. Okay, then we'll move on to the final section, which is 30 minutes of questions from the audience. And as I say, you can either send a contact request to Magic Sandwich Show or send a PM on Blog TV and I will read the question out. And the first one I'm going to start with comes from, um, I'm sorry, I probably mispronounced this, Warshash. No, no, I'm not even going to try. Um, he says as follows, um, Jason, even if we grant your premise that one can believe in God and not always act like one does, 
what does behaving in such a way say about the strength of a believer's conviction? Jason, uh, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to invite both of you to respond to all the questions, but that one obviously directed at you, Jason, so you go first. Uh, I think it, it, it depends. It, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of truth in what negation of P's video. It, there's a lot of truth in it, you know, about the way you act and, and how you act tells a lot about what you believe. So there is a lot of truth in that. And, and the Christian faith talks about in John chapter 1, uh, 1 John chapter 1 and 1 John chapter 4 and 5, it talks about walk in the light, obey, love, love the poor, uh, don't hate your brother. If you hate your brother, you're not truly a Christian. Um, but it also says, but if you sin, you can... Uh, conf if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So the Bible expects high standards. It expects you to walk uh, in love and, and obedience. But it has an allowance that you will make mistakes, you will fail. That's one point. The other thing is, there are grades within the Christian life. It talks about babes in Christ, and it talks about being mature in Christ. Now some people can have... Uh, you know, in China, they haven't got Bibles, okay? So, they, 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 a Christian will be a babe in Christ. They won't know much. So, the way they live, uh, you know, they won't have much knowledge. And, you know, the Christian faith is based on intellectual knowledge, and they won't have much intellectual knowledge. And so, that will have an effect on how they behave. And someone who's mature uh, and will, will have more intellectual knowledge. So, these these... What I'm saying is there's, there's the strict obey, that we've got to strictly obey God, but we allow us for failure. But even in, the, even in the Christian faith, there are grades of obedience. People, it has allowances for people's failures and weaknesses. Uh, it says we're new creatures in Christ, but if you're a drug addict and you've just got saved, you're, you know, you can, you can be loving, but you're going to be struggling for maybe six weeks, a year, many years with your drug addiction you know um are you going to say the person's not a christian because they're still taking drugs no you, you they, they've got a problem with drugs it doesn't mean to say they're not a christian so just because some actions are not consistent um doesn't necessarily mean that they don't believe you know and i think this video is trying to do too much it's trying to do too much it's a good I'm going to pause it there because obviously we only have 30 sorry, minutes uh, sorry, and I'm uh, trying to be fair with it so far as time is concerned. Negation. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Answered for about three to four minutes, so feel free to use that amount of time. Okay. Uh, basically, yeah, I think that's a great question because it, it speaks to the heart of my argument. Um, and I think the problem is, is when the theist comes back and tries to establish that God is real, it only makes his um, job that much harder to explain his actions. In the same way that, let's say that I have a child and I live on a busy street, I live on that street my entire life. I have, I'm fully aware of the hazards that that street have, and I decide that I'm going to let my child play out front unescorted, and the kid gets in the street and gets killed. And the police officer shows up and says, you know, explain what's going on. And instead of, an ex, instead of explaining my actions, I'm going to go off and tell him the history of the road, tell him how dangerous it is, tell, me, tell him every um, wreck that's happened on that road. That's going to hang me in a court of law because I have no way around explaining why my actions, how I could have taken those actions when I understand fully the hazards involved. Now, in this al analogy, the child is your soul. And the hazards are the sins. Now, when you say that God is going to punish you in such a way, the same way that gravity will punish me if I step outside my aircraft, and you still step outside that aircraft, there's a huge disconnect there. And why no one will answer that, I don't know, but I'm not going to get into that again. Thanks. That's all I had. Okay, in that case, uh, we've got one uh, live caller. Um, just take me a moment to bring him into the call. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. And yourselves? Very well indeed. Uh, you have a question for us. Is it directed at anyone in particular? 
Uh, no, no, no. Uh, yes. I think negation and Jason can, can both address this. Uh, basically, the, the whole conversation around, on the whole question around um, why we do immoral things under certain circumstances, the re question I really had to ask is, if the Christian God is the ultimate source of morality for human beings, why are there so many cultures in the world with differing sets and understandings of morality? And which one's the correct one? Okay, I'm going to go with uh, negation first, because Jason went first last time. Uh, negation, uh, within reasonable time limits, um, give us your thoughts on that. Okay. Um, I look at morality as an evolutionary process, kind of in the same way that, you know, um, computers or science are. Um, you're absolutely right. I believe that mor morality is, let's say, a fluid movement. Um, and a a moral norm is based on what you were brought up to believe um, in society. Um, what would be the the worst case scenario um, for cruelty as far as we look at it? Probably, I would say, a child being tortured or, um, you know, spit in that way. Well, the Aztecs had no problem doing that. They sacrificed 80,000 people in a day, it's estimated. 250,000 people a year to appease their gods. Literally bringing people to the top of their temples and cutting their hearts out without anesthesia, disemboweling, human um, skinning of these people. All of that was viewed as moral because the gods deemed it so. Now, of course, we can get into the youth of dilemma from this, but what I'm saying is, is that absolutely I think that you're, you're on point. Morals evolve. And the, the more intelligent we become, the better as a species we become, the more we're going to get to where we do care about the entire um, race, and we're not going to have these... Um, Sorry, Jason, I don't mean this in a negative way, but um, basic beliefs that there's a God there, therefore God says that we must do it. We're going to run it through the filter and see if it truly is moral. That's all I have. Jason, before I come to you, I noticed that we're being featured. Uh, if you happen to be watching us from the outside, so to speak, do feel free to come and join us. You'll be joining a live academic debate between uh, Negation of P and Jason Burns. The question or the title of the debate being, why do you behave as you do when you know God is watching? So do come and join us. I've got about another 20 minutes left. Um, Jason, over to you. Um, yeah, uh, John Lennox in his, in his book, Gunning for God, <coughs> talks about the is or distinction. And he talks about um, uh, David Hume and Wittgenstein talked about how you can't get from the is to the ought in morality. In other words, nature does not say anything about morality doesn't say anything about morality. There's no morality in nature, end of. So if you're an evolutionist, you could talk about morality, but there is no morality. All you're talking about is social norms, but that's not morality in the terms of having value for an individual. Evolution and atheist, um, atheist uh, 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 ethics is more ontological. It's about action. Christian ethics is more about um, ontology. That is to say, uh, sorry, uh, uh, I'm just a bit tired and a bit nervous now. Um, evolution works and, and uh, atheist ethics works on um, uh, on the functionalism uh, of of what a person of a person's meaningful in their action. Christian um, ethics works on ontology. That is, your being, your very essence, is a moral being, and you uh, are valuable as a human being. And that is not something that you can have from nature. Nature doesn't do that. The is or distinction. So I would say that if you look at history, human beings are moral creatures. All right. That is nothing to do with evolution. When you say someone is a moral creature, you're saying that they have value. You're saying that they have purpose. And when you look at human beings, if you look at history, they might express it in different ways but they have a sense of desire to try to love each other. They might express it in a different way than you or I, but they have a desire for justice. You look at the Armani tablets, there's a sense of justice there. If you look at the Egyptian culture, look back at, you look at Athenian culture, you look at uh, ancient so Socrates and the Athenians, you look at Buddha, you look at the Hindus. There's a sense of people are valuable and we want justice and we want to love each other, but there's also screwed upness and that's part of the morality in the sense that we fail, we make mistakes. 
you know, that's the practical reality of life. It's not just logic. I, I don't mean to cut anybody I'm off. I'm sorry. Um, Negation, do go on. Well, I, I don't mean to cut anybody off. Um, Jason, I'd love to explore this a little bit with you if you would like to hear my thoughts on morality and kind of do a little back and forth on this. Uh, yeah, uh, feel free, but don't forget, we finish it after, uh, after half an hour, mate, because I'm getting tired, mate. <laughs> I understand. Um, I, well, I don't want to cut off the um, questions. DPR, how many questions do we have? Uh, not that many, so feel free to carry on. Okay. Um, this is going to be kind of a, a really quick back and forth, Jason, if you don't mind. Could well, you well, tell me... Well, well, could well. You, no, excuse yeah. me. We agree. We agree. Yeah, that, to, that's to, exactly... To, yeah, we agreed to the questions right. at the end. That, that, we had structure. Wait, we had wait, structure. wait, wait, no, wait, wait, Jason. No, no negation. Listen, listen, no. I'm not going to ask a question, Jason. That's why I asked if you wanted okay. to go this way. If you don't, then we'll go back to the, the, the questions. That's fine. Okay, bro. What would what, you rather do? Which, which do you want to do, Jason? Well, I, 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 I mentally, I've mentally prepared myself with the structure that we had. Okay, we'll stick with that then. I, just, I, thought, that, I thought it was an interesting way to go, but that's fine. So in that case, uh, I'm going to... Negation, if you want to say something, I don't mind that. If you want to say something. No. Well, did, okay, <sighs> well, let's go back. Okay. Let's go back to the caller and see if he wanted to come back on anything. I've got a couple more questions that have just been uh, PM'd to me. So well, we've got plenty to fill in the time, but did, you, did that answer your question? Um, well, yeah, in, uh, I think um, Negation addressed it well, but uh, I think Jason tried to avoid the question uh, by shoving it off into evolution. Well, I, don't, I don't want to get into that sort of thing. If you, have you got well, yeah. that question, or um, I'll move on. If there wasn't something about it, I don't say that it's a morality as we understand it, but uh, animals wouldn't be able to propagate their species if they didn't have some sense of what's right or wrong for their species. So you don't see, and I hate to use this example, piranhas going around killing each other, you know, that sort of thing. So there is, in evolution, a morality born just from the uh, natural selection and survival of the fittest. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pause you there because obviously it's uh, the speakers we want to hear from. I'm also going to remove you, but thank you very much indeed for the call. Uh, Jason, what's being suggested there is animals have morals, so the existence of morals means or proves what exactly? Uh, we, we, you've got to ask the question, what is, a, what is moral? When I use the word moral, I mean free agent. You're able to act and also there is value in you as a person and value in the other person. Nature doesn't say anything about value. End of. I think the question was, do animals have morals? Well, obviously, um, it's not the same as, it's not the same, what, when I say that they are able to act, but they can only act in according to their nature, so they don't have morals as human beings have morals. I don't want to take negation space, but I thought that that was the crux of your whole argument that we don't have control over our nature uh, insofar as masturbation lying and stealing is concerned yeah but that but i didn't bring in uh the neuroscience and uh, in the debate there's a very important part of um the the uh, thought process if you study neuroscience i, I just listened to a lecture today at our church we had a, an expert in psychology and neuroscience come and he was telling us that the brain has about seven seconds to make a decision. It's not aware of it. It just comes in the mind. And, and you're not aware of the connections within the brain. Um, and if you're in a... It, it brings the image of a past event. It, we'd have to go back to the neuroscience. But, um, so if you get that image of a past... if We'll just have to go back track because it's important. Like I said, the, in the neuroscience, the brain at the frontal lobe is logic, and in the and in the middle, it, it's uh, emotion and pain, uh, pleasure and pain. Okay, if a person say is a drug addict, uh, Mr. Jones, and uh, he's been a past drug addict, but he's changed, he's reformed, um, and as he goes on in life, uh, and he experiences some uh, stress. That is seen as pain within the middle of the brain, but the pain will react, will, will affect the pleasure part of the brain. So it will bring up his old experiences for drugs. Now, at that point... Jason, I fear that you're 
simply uh, recounting what you've already said because no, no, of the no, time this, no, this, no, in neuroscience, these seven seconds... Seven yes, seconds. you've made that point three times no, now. No, seven seconds subconsciously. And you're not you've made aware the point three times now, Jason. We've only got ten minutes left. So the, point, the, the point is, the point is uh, he, he can actually agree to that, that image coming to him. And if he does, he'll go back to his old ways. Okay, and so it's been made the point, Jason. I'm going to insist that you stop that. So fish, Jason. fish, fish are not aware. Uh, that Jason, fish. you've made the point. Okay, fish are not aware of it. DPR, DPR, let him finish real quick. I don't, I don't mind spending some of my time. Go ahead. Fish, fish are not conscious of these images in order to make choices like that. Okay, negation. Okay, sorry guys. Um, I guess I'll just make my point with um with the is ought Jason I don't know if you're aware of this but you can't get to the is ought or can't um, can't um, account for is ought either and what I mean by that is is that most people when they are talking about why we should do something or the ought and when you use God as your test to define what the ought should be because God is in his infinite um, oh, love and all of that well, when I ask every, well, I shouldn't say every, when I a ask most theists, what does it mean to be moral, most of them say it's reflecting of God's nature. Now, if we use that, you have real problems, because I think we can all agree that harming children is just about the worst thing you could possibly do. We have multiple um, examples in the Bible. Exodus uh, 4, 21 through 23, where... Um, and that's the one that I, I key on. In that, that's where the Lord tells Moses to go back and tell Pharaoh to let his people go. But beforehand, he tells Moses that he is going to harden Pharaoh's heart. In other words, he is going to brainwash him to the point where he doesn't have the ability to let him go. And because of that action that God mandated, he kills every firstborn. Now, is that moral? And if your morals are reflective of that God, I fear for you. So you can't get to the Izzat any better than we can. So be careful with that. That's all I have. Jason, do you want to respond quickly to that before I take the next question? No, this, it just makes me laugh because I, I, I like the bit about, about um, Moses and Pharaoh, and I've had a lot of talks with atheists about that. That's why I'm laughing, you know. I'm not laughing okay. at you. It's just, right, just let's take the next question then. We've only got but, 10 um, minutes left. It's a good point. A good point, Negation. Uh, the next question I'm reading out comes from Logical Statements uh, 183, and he asks, uh, why isn't, why, why are you, Jason, not a Muslim? Um, I'm not a Muslim because of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about, is good historical source, it was, uh, most scholars would agree that it's a, uh, um, uh, first century 64 AD uh, or even before that is it goes back to like uh, 54 AD and even earlier source historical source of the resurrected historical Christ and um, I have a choice between the Muslim uh, uh, Mohammed who says he knows about Jesus 600 years um, about Christ uh, or I have this early historical document of the Apostle Paul and I would rather go with someone who has, was closer to the event historically and is backed up by other historical materials such as Tacitus and we could go on and on and on and that's why I'm not a Muslim. Negation. Um, I would let, let me run the question out, I suppose. The question really is saying um, how do you choose one religion from another? I, I'm presuming that's the, behind the question. That's, that's the million dollar question, and especially when you're looking at Pascal's wager. Um, not only is, there, is it problematic when you have decided on which specific religion you look at, but then to, to justify which sect of that religion is almost ins insurmountable. Christianity alone, we're looking at 33,000 different sects. Now, my challenge to anyone who wants to bring out Pascal's wager is that how do you know that what you're doing is not only as bad as what I'm doing by just not believing, but in effect going against the first commandment 
and pissing God off on a daily basis because of the God that you're worshiping is not the real God. Even if you are a Christian, you could potentially be a part of one of these sects that doesn't respect him in that way and doesn't follow what God wanted you to do. So, yeah, there's a, there's a problem there with trying to figure out why people believe and why they don't. Um, I say it's, again, society. You're, you're I think Jason is itching to come back. Jason. Uh, Pascal's wager. Um, most academics don't really understand Pascal's wager. And also you've got to look at Pascal's wager in its context. If you read his book, and I encourage you to read his book, you'll find it's all, he, Pascal's very important about evidences for the Christian faith. So, you know, it's not an, an, a lack of intellectualism in objectivity. So Pascal Wager in the context of his book, and also it talks, you look into, get, go and study the issue about infinite uh, and, and finite. These are key terms. It's a bit complex, but you need to go and have a look at that. Very few academics, if you go on to uh, philosophy encyclopedia, Oh, Stanford Philosophical Encyclopedia, go on there, read what they have to say. Even they don't understand. Even Hitchens didn't understand Pascal's wager because very few academics realize the, fi the, the words about finite and infinite. A lot of academics have missed that. Jason, the next question for you is, what if you're wrong? Um, what if I'm wrong? Um, I, think, I think the thing is, is coming back to Francis Schaeffer, it's about thinking and it's about always being open. Dominic Crossan, who is is not an evangelical, is in Jesus seminar, he's, he's kind of like on the left, he said this, he said data, he, he was Irish, data is significant and the important thing is is to think and look at the data and I believe that Christianity is based on historical evidence of the historical Christ and I, I feel the data is there and that's why I believe but you must be willing to be exposed to other data so it's important to read the Gnostic Gospels and to read widely uh, I am convinced and I love the Lord Jesus and I wish you'd come and know the Lord Jesus but at the same time you've got to be open to other people's data as well so I would say go and read go and think read the atheists read the Christians and think Yes, I didn't actually answer the question. What if you're wrong? Um, I, Basically, I, but your answer was, well, I don't think I am wrong. That was not answering the question. The question was, what if you're wrong? I, 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 I can't envision, I can't, I can't, I, I have this, Mr. Jones, I, I just have this love for Jesus, and I can't, it's like if I, me imagining that I don't love my wife, I, I just can't imagine that. Right, let's you want that one at um, negation. No. Negation, what if you're wrong? Uh, what if I'm wrong? Well, if I'm standing in front of a deity that is going to uh, oh, be looking at me as far as what my life was lived at, um, if that deity, let's, for argument's sake, say it is the Christian God, that God is going to know me, and he's going to know me more intimately than anyone ever has known me. He'll know why I made my decisions. He'll understand that the way he constructed me forced me into a position to where I had to question. I had to look at evidence. And the evidence that I found, I didn't find convincing. And if that is enough, knowing that my heart was nothing more than trying to find truth, if that's enough to condemn me, then I guess I'll have to accept my fate. Okay, being aware of the time, I'm going to say one last question, and um, we're going to have to be fairly brief on this because we've only got uh, five minutes left. Um, I'm, I'm going to try and re rephrase it um, slightly. Uh, I think it's, well, it's directed at both of you. Um, and it goes back to the mor morality point. If morals don't evolve, then would we not be in a position where we still endorsed slavery, as is uh, encouraged in the Bible? Jason, um, I think it comes back. It, it comes back to the fall, you know, for, from a Christian perspective, that we are fallen human beings, and unfortunately, uh, because of the fall, um, it it affect it, it's affected us. So some cultures uh, will live according to the. This is how we see it. Will live according to the light, uh, but other cultures. Um, 
will not and also uh, you know some people can be just plain disobedient I mean for example so in Haiti I'm going to press you the question okay. is if we lived in biblical times uh, or according to the Bible slavery would still be acceptable how do you explain that um, well I come back to the resurrection of re resurrection of Christ you know we see Christians history through the lens of Christ now Christ never endorsed slavery he so, never condoned it either did he uh, well when Jesus Christ died on the cross that was that was all class distinctions would did de would were destroyed he died for everybody gay slaves everybody the Son of God died for everybody and so that is our crux that is our hermeneutical lens when we read the the uh, the Old Testament and Nietzsche never Nietzsche the German philosopher had no axe to grind he always thought that Christianity was about love but he didn't like it negation um, I'm a little surprised that um, Jason would say that um, there's no uh, there's no um, slavery in the New Testament um, I would Definitely, My understanding you know. indication is that Jesus never spoke of it, um, and if you look at Matthew 5, 16, 17, he said he didn't come to change the laws. Well, and he did also, um, yeah, I mean, you look at Luke, you look at Timothy, you look at uh, uh, Ephesians, uh, there's all mentions of slaves in there. In fact, if you look at Ephesians, slaves obey your masters with a depth, depth and respect, serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Um, now, maybe it's not from Jesus' lips, but again, if we're going to look at consistency, and we're going to look at this is truth, in, in, in fact, capital T truth, then it can't be changed. It, it has to hold true in the same way that 2 plus 2 is always 4. Um, it doesn't all of a sudden change to 2 plus 2 is blue whale. Um, it's going to stay the same regardless of context, regardless of everything else. That is the definition of objectivity. Um, so I'm very surprised that um, this slavery issue would come up because when the question speaks to if we were living in biblical times, well, according to Jason and the rest of the theists, we are living in biblical times. And it speaks to this argument that we're living in biblical times. Everything is applicable, applicable according to the Bible. We're, as a people, though, picking and choosing certain things that do and do not apply. So, again, I'm not understanding the discontinuity. Let's go back to Jason. And Jason, perhaps you can address this point. There's nothing in the Bible, New Testament, anywhere, um, that condones slavery. Would you accept that? And if so, uh, why? Why, uh, why do we not accept it as a society uh, now? Uh, first of all, Dominic Crossan, who's not an evangelical, is on the is on the left um, in the debate, uh, and Marcus Borg in the debate with James White uh, talked about. He, he mentioned slavery, and he said he said that in Philemon, uh, Paul um, that is is th this is what he said. He said that it, it doesn't condone slavery, and yet he says in Ephesians it does. The key. The key, the key thing for the Christian is to come back to the cross and what the cross was all about. The cross was the Son of God dying for everybody. Okay, it was dying for slavery. And so in Galatians, Paul talks about there's neither woman nor Jew nor Greek, etc., that nor slave, whatever. We are all one in Christ. So Christ broke broke the the way of um, he broke the the sort of the class distinctions, but. The way the Bible, the way the New Testament, you've got to get a handle on this. How does the gospel break social structures, immoral social structures? And it breaks it through the cross in, in the sense that, um, you know, the, the, the... I'd like the, to come back on this. When people, when people realize that they are loved before God and that God died for them, then you should treat them as you would be treated. And so Paul is not advocating uh, slavery. He's, he's, he's advocating that you treat your person, the person like the Son of God has treated you, died for you. 
Okay, uh, can I just, before I come back to your negation uh, point, I, that, that is the 30 minutes up. What I intend to do, if it's okay with both of you, is allow uh, negation just to come back on that point for no more than two minutes. Give you both then one minute um, each uh, to finish off with, and then I will tell you where you'll be able to see this video. Okay. So negation first, uh, just dealing with that specific point, um, no more than two minutes, and then one minute each. Okay, Jason, you stated that Jesus being on the cross broke the um, apparently the Old Testament covenant. Um, what I'm not understanding, and we've had this conversation, if that's true, then explain why homosexuality is wrong, because that's an old covenant. That is Leviticus, Deuteronomy. That is not New Testament. So why is that still wrong? But slavery, if you're going to break slavery, in other words, why don't you break um, homosexuality in the same way? I Again, think that that opens up so many cans of worms. I know, I'm sorry. I'm not going to go there, but I'm going to invite first uh, Jason just one minute uh, to... Uh, to finish off with, and then one minute from negation, and then, as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap everything up. Okay, I just want to say thanks to everybody. Um, I think negation's uh, more sharper than me, more logical, more, more, you know, he's a, he's a much cleverer person than me, and I just thank you for having a t chat with me, negation, and I've loved every minute of it, and I just want to thank uh, Mr. Jones, who's been an excellent host, and uh, it's been really nice to be with you, sir, and live life. And just thanks everybody for coming. Um, you've challenged me, and I've got a lot to think about. And uh, so thank you for the time. And I hope it's been a bene bit beneficial to everybody. Everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, really appreciate it. And just wish everybody a happy evening. Thank you. Okay, negation. Oh, yeah, I, I just want to kind of reflect all of the things that um, Jason said. Jason, again, I know this has got to be hard for you um, coming into the lion's den. I absolutely appreciate what you're doing, and I hope that you didn't take anything that I said as a personal insult or anything else. I'm just literally asking questions. Um, as far as you know, how I think the debate went, um, you know, I just I, I still am a little disappointed that it it, did, it really never did seem like it, it got to the question. But again, you know, we can do what we can do. Um, I'm more than happy to you know take this on again if you want to, Jason, or even something else. I mean, I I definitely love it. Um, your your comment about me being sharper than you, <laughs> I don't think that you know that enters into it in any way, shape, or form. I'm not trying to be good or slick or whatever it's just i have questions and i've had a chance to develop these questions for literally 25 years and you know so they're kind of at hand um i hope you didn't feel like i was trying to make you feel you know stupid or anything else um everybody in the in the chat y'all were great i loved it um anybody that's still out there on the um outside we do this every saturday or we do at least a show every saturday please come in and jason you're welcome anytime thanks and thank DPR you. thinks you did a great job. Thank you very much to uh, both of you. Um, thank you also to everyone that turned up. Thank you for the questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them. Uh, I know that uh, Live Life is going to um, finish off um, and include in his finishing remarks exactly where you may be able to see this video uh, when it's posted on the internet. But I just want to um, echo uh, Negation's point that uh, they do have a show, that is to say Live Life and Negation. Um, every Saturday, uh, Skeptic Friends, well worth going to see. Um, and uh, on that note, thanks again to everyone, and I'll leave it to uh, Live Life to close the show. Thank you. Thanks, DPR. Uh, thumbs up for DPR Negation and Jason Burns. They all did a wonderful job. DPR Jones, great job moderating. I do appreciate it. Also, if you guys are familiar with DPR Jones, he also does a show, too, on Sundays on uh, the Magic Sandwich Show, so make sure you guys go check that out, too. We host it here every... Uh, Saturday from 8 to 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, uh, me negation. We talk about the hot topics in the news um, that pertain to religion, politics, so on and so forth. Um, so make sure you guys subscribe to the show. I do appreciate it. And uh, Jason Burns, I accept your uh, invitation to be friends, so I appreciate it. And um, guys, great job. Thumbs up for everybody. And that's about it. Good night, all. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Live Life. Thanks, Mr. Jones. Thanks, Negation. Thanks, everybody. God bless.